Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Pellegrini, and I direct the CSSW Writing Center. Um, together with Professor Chin Gao, I help to co coordinate this and other events in the CSSW Writing Live series. And I'm just so happy to be here and have such a great group of um, people to, to hear talk about this, this theme, this very important theme. Um, and welcome, everybody, and thanks for being here. I will pass it off to Dean Melissa Beck. Thanks so much, Adam. I'm glad to have another of, of these sessions with you. Welcome everybody to the fourth installment of Columbia School of Social Work's Writing Lives Roundtable series, in which accomplished scholars and colleagues from our community discuss their experiences, their challenges, and their strategies as writers. Um, and today I'm really delighted to welcome a panel that includes both faculty and student presenters from CSSW, all of whom speak and or write in more than one language and whose personal and professional experiences span countries and cultures. I think we're really lucky today to have such a dynamic group uh, for this discussion, and it'll give us a unique chance to talk about what it's like to write across languages and cultures. And we hope, above all, that this roundtable inspires you to reflect on how your own language and backgrounds continue to shape your experiences and your growth and your practices uh, as writers in social work. So enough from me. Uh, I'm really thrilled to introduce our four panelists today. Um, first is Dr. Mashura Akilova, who, as you know, is a lecturer in discipline here at Columbia School of Social Work. Second, Dr. Jaime Estades, who's adjunct assistant professor also here at Columbia Social Work. Third is Dr. Robert Fullalove, who's uh, an interdisciplinary professor with appointments both here in social work as well as in the Melman School of Public Health. And last but certainly not least, uh, our colleague Jung Hyun or Jennifer So. She is a doctoral student and a graduate research assistant right here at CSSW. So, uh, Mishura, Jaime, Bob, and Jennifer, welcome. We are really proud that you're members of our community and we're dying to hear from you. So, I thought we could start off our session today by asking each of you to say just a few words about your writing lives and, and the theme of this session. And I'll, I'll just go through that list alphabetically as I introduced you, starting with Mashura, if you would step up. Sure, yeah, thank you so much for having us. Um, we talked a lot uh, with Adam about how this writing sessions are very helpful. It has always been helpful to me as a student and to me as a scholar and a writer. Um, it, it is always useful. So um, I speak three languages uh, interchangeably, uh, English being uh, my working language, but uh, Russian included in this uh, as I work in the post-Soviet um, areas. I speak Tajik, which is a version of Farsi, um, but with Cyrillic, which is my native language, but I don't write in it. Unfortunately, I used to when I while I was in Tajikistan, but with uh, not having you know the experience or you know being there, there using my Tajik is more of a, a language of home, com like communication at home <laughs> with my family members. Um, I guess my writing has definitely been uh, affected by all of my experience. I have worked a little bit as a journalist and had a training as a journalist, which was so influential. And we'll get to maybe talk about it a little bit later on, but a lot of trial and errors um, that have influenced um, the, the way I write today. So thank you. Thank you, Mishara. I'm eager to dig into a lot of that. Um, but uh, uh, intro remarks. Jaime, uh, welcome. What would you like to share with our group today? First, thank you for the invitation uh, to be here. And uh, this is my, my first time participating in this type of forum or any forum uh, as a writer. And my I started writing when I was like in first grade and on my own. And I'm dyslexic, so I had I didn't know that I was writing everything wrong. So eventually, I didn't know that I was dyslexic until I took a psychology class uh, in my during my BA, and the professor mentioned dyslexia, and I realized that that's what I had, <laughs> and how difficult it was for me to read. Uh, uh, but writing started very early, but everything I kept it to myself. I never uh, shared with with anyone. I come from a very macho culture in which uh, writing poems and things like that uh, 
uh, during, especially during those times, was an asset uh, by the people in the community as something that uh, a man should be doing. Uh, I come from a very working class background. So I always kept those things for myself. And since I finished my BA, my master's and my Juris Doctor, uh, I have been writing about social justice and social policy issues. I have been published by some newspapers like The Hill in, in Washington. I have like four or five, I think like four articles that are there. And I also wrote for, uh, I started writing about boxing. My first article were in a, in a website for, for, uh, that talks about boxing. And I wrote, and the people that were reading in my articles in the website, I, I, they thought that I was a little bit above uh, in terms of my writing in, and that sometimes I use some words that people didn't understand. And I told them, welcome to the club. I just thought that it sounded good, so I put it there. And I got a lot of good feedback and then I started publishing. I wrote a study for my, uh, my a thesis for my master's degree and I'm gonna make the story short. And I was working in a union and the study was about the living conditions of, of, of union workers at District 65 UAW and the New York Times published, not didn't publish my study, but it quoted me and quoted the study. And that was after five years of being here in the United States. So I kept writing. Uh, and now I write plays, I, I write everything that comes to mind. Uh, but it's a lot of solitude. Uh, I think that every uh, writer will tell you that. Uh, and that's, you have to be willing to let all the demons and all the good things come and take them and accept them and put them out there with the risk of embarrassing yourself. Thank you, Jaime, appreciate that. Bob, glad you're here with us today. <laughs> and I am uh, really happy to be here. I think this is my, uh, my first official presentation as a, a new member of the interdisciplinary team that is part of Columbia Social Work. So where do I begin? <clears throat> I'm trying not to be long-winded, which is a terrible, terrible trait for those of us who are professors. I am someone who speaks French fluently. Let me just say that and not try to qualify. It is not my native language. In 1988, I had a trip to Paris that was an occasion for me to basically bring out high school and college French. My last college class in French was in 1966. I'm an old guy. So there's a 22 year lap between my first real opportunity in Paris to speak French and when I last taken it formally, as part of my uh, academic career, I became obsessed with the language. I speak it fluently and I'm self-taught, which is something that the French adore. Number one, those of you who speak the language know, French is a performance language. You don't just speak it. The big mistake that a lot of Americans make is that they believe meaning in language is conferred by the words that you use. Not in France, you perform the language. So in a career that has had me going to France every year since 1988, I'm very, very much aware of how important my ability to communicate in that language has made it possible for me to do a lot of work in France that would normally not be the province of someone who was born in the United States. I work with a project in the city of Nantes, which is all about the building of a slave ship. How's that? It's called Le Bateau Pédagogique. It was put together by a number of individuals who are French citizens, originally from Martinique. And it deals with the issue that the average person in France, like the average person in the United States, has no understanding of the role of the slave trade in the creation of the modern nation of France. Those of you who are aware of all of our efforts here in the US to get critical race theory, part of what we teach our kids in the public school so that they understand something about the history of slavery and its impact on American culture. The same kind of thing exists in France. So my ability to represent everybody who is from the African diaspora, who is in this part of the world, represents an opportunity to help people understand 
exactly what we're trying to convey with critical race theory, but it doesn't just stop there. I've been a professeur MDT or Conservatoire National des Arts Métiers, a visiting professor at the National Conservatory of Arts and Trades in Paris. I have had a number of opportunities with Mindy Fully Love to deal with French urbanists. Mindy Fully Love has written five books that are very much focused on our travels in France and our look at the, the issue of urbanism as it is dealt with by folks who are all about the building of cities that when they're done correctly can deal with some of the issues that are so problematic for those of us in the United States who live in neighborhoods that are rigidly segregated by race. This is not to say that France is not a racist country. It is, it is. But working with folk who are trying, as is the case here, to deal with issues of racism and how it expresses itself in space is meant that my ability to work with the language and not have to go through a translator has really made that one of the most enjoyable and at some levels influential parts of the work that I do here as a professor of public health. I'm very much, very much aware of the fact that there are many of folk who are also clear that the folk who speak French aren't confined to France. 64% of all French speakers in the world are in Africa. So it's also given me an opportunity to work with folk in Morocco, Guinea, and on occasion in Tunis, just as a way of saying that this has been a way of opening a door to work that I do internationally in public health that has been made entirely possible by the fact that I perform as well as speak the French language. Let me stop there. That's terrific, Bob. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that background. And Jen, we're delighted and grateful that you're taking time away from your studies uh, as a PhD student to join us today. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me into the space. I I'm just incredibly honored and also excited to be a part of this panel. Um, so I am a second year doctoral student here at the School of Social Work. And I think this topic, when I first encountered it, um, just came immediately so endearing um, to my heart and also deeply reflective of my personal as well as professional experience as a Korean um, English bilingual. So I was born and raised in Korea. Um, and my family immigrated to the US when I um, had just turned 12. I think it was just a few days after we arrived here. Um, and as a 1.5 generation Korean immigrant, um, my, my, I think my like writing, speaking and language experiences have been deeply shaped by that very identity and experience as an immigrant, because um, when I reflect on my writing, history, uh, first and foremost, writing has been a tool of advocacy for first and foremost, my family and by extension, my Korean speaking community members. And um, I think I've primarily used writing as a way to also bridge and facilitate communication. And professionally, I have worked in um, organizations and spaces that were predominantly working with Korean speaking immigrants. So most of the writing in that sense has also translated into um, community facing, whether it be uh, practice related, program related and outreach related materials. Um, but since I started school here at the School of Social Work, um, it feels like I've been like working on a different set of muscles. It's like going to the gym after a season of not going um, and sort of starting to build a new set of muscles that is uh, required, um, I think, in the space of academia. Um, and in that sense, I, I feel like I'm rediscovering what it means to write in both Korean and English because of most of my uh, writing in educational space has been English, but I am sort of going back to Korean and rediscovering, relearning how to write as a uh, growing and learning academic. That's wonderful. Thank you. you. You're all bringing such a variety of, of backgrounds and experiences to this discussion. It's going to be uh, wonderful, I know. So I'm going to start to throw out a few questions now, and I encourage the audience to use the Q&A box uh, to, to add more questions if you would like, and I'll, I'll keep tabs on that as we move along. But just to begin, um, let's start with, are you writing right now? And if so, what are you writing? Something for yourself, something for others? And I invite anybody to jump in. I am currently writing, although there is uh, um, like time is of, uh, an issue always uh, when uh, during, during the semester, most of my writing happens uh, during summer when <laughs> the, there are no, uh, I'm not teaching, but, uh, or 
I'm not working on other projects, but right now I'm working on a chapter on um, for the encyclopedia of uh, qualitative research um, that is focusing on community and university partnership research that is going to be based on some of the experiences um, uh, based uh, of, of a class uh, and student partnership with the field agencies in Jordan and Turkey. So um, this is what I'm working on right now, but like uh, we recently finished um, a, co, uh, a co edited book on social work, integrative social work practice with um, refugees, asylum seekers, and other displaced persons. So that was um, a work uh, of um, two and a half years uh, during the COVID times. And, and that's something that we are very proud of uh, with colleagues. <laughs> well, right now I'm finishing uh, a couple of articles that I intend I hopefully they will be published in in a couple of magazines that that I have in mind uh, and they are related to uh, cultural hegemony and how cultural hegemony uh, is one of the biggest causes of trauma uh, in society and I start from with the Constitution of the United States which I think is the atom of why we are here and why this country thinks the way it thinks. Uh, so I start from there and I develop it on other issues that enter into clinical social work and psychology. Um, I have a, a phrase from my last play, which is a class now at Columbia, it's called Five Sessions, uh, Five Sessions of Therapy. And the, the super who's the client in the play tells the therapist because he's a very well-educated activist. So even when he's a super, he's very well educated and the, the therapist uh, has a different vision of him when he comes to the door. And he tells her, uh, do you think that slaves in the South would have felt better about slavery if they had had therapy three times a week? And of course, the answer is no. And that's a criticism uh, that I make about the practice of psychology and clinical social work. And I do it with a lot of respect, but as a person of color, as a working class person, and someone that has gone to therapy before, it has always been a frustration that uh, we are evaluated wrongly. And the issues of, for example, slavery, we don't have slavery, but we have oppression. Oppression caused trauma. And we are not doing anything. Uh, usually everything is in terms of the individual. And why is it that we don't incorporate uh, tactics of fighting back, of organizing? And to finish, uh, the one that I'm writing now, uh, I talk about my three social workers heroes, which are uh, Harry Tubman, because she liberated this, this, the, I mean, she helped to free the slaves. And the moment they were free and ran up north, their psychic changed completely. They were very happy. So my point with that is that social, uh, social justice and, and organizing can be as healing or more than therapy. Second is Martin Luther King, is my, uh, my other uh, social work hero because he changed policy in the United States. And there was a lot of healing that took place just with policy. And the third one is Robin Hood because for the struggle, we need someone to raise funds. And, you know, the, that's the other thing. I cannot write anything without, he will be in charge of redistributing the wealth. And the other thing is that I use humor uh, in everything I write. It's not about humor only, but it's important because as a dyslexic, you need to, I needed to be attracted to something that I didn't feel was boring. So humor is very important in my writing. Let me, if I can, chime in with what I'm doing. This is what I'm currently trying to write about. I've been invited to be the keynote presenter at this conference, which is gonna be held in France, May 19th. And part of what it's asking the folk who attend to think about is the relationship between architecture and health. 
Now there's a specific thing about hospitals, but for me, the opportunity to talk about the experience of COVID-19 in the United States, where geography had as much to do with where you are and how healthy you are as anything else, really means that the capacity to give a view of public health as is seen from the United States is really important when you try and communicate similar kinds of findings to folk in France. Why? Because the French government, by law, does not permit folk to collect data on individual French citizens that describes their race, their ethnicity, or their religion. So their entire way of approaching issues in social work and public health is devoid of the notion of racial disparities that is so much a part of what all of us are engaged with politically as well as culturally if we're involved in either of these two disciplines, social work or public health. So I get to sort of talk about what do you know when you're able to characterize a neighborhood that has been impacted by COVID-19 by the race and ethnicity of the folk are there? And does that give us something important to use when we start thinking about future preventive measures? And does it help us deal with the issues that we in the US have identified as driving the health of the general public? which is basically a realization that racism is one of the most important social drivers of much of what we see in hospitals, much of what we see in the health of the general public. And being able to try and do that in a nation and in a culture and in a language that isn't comfortable dealing with those kinds of concepts is part of the challenge that I've got to overcome when I make this keynote presentation at a place far away from New York City. I'd love to share a few things um, that I've been working on. So I started keeping a journal um, growing up. I think it was about seven years when I started. Um, so I continue to keep a journal. I think it's been such a grounding experience and um, sort of practice for me. Um, it's handwritten every day, a lot of like personal and spiritual reflections. And this has also helped me throughout the past like year and a half of um, doctoral studies. And also I, as a student, there's always like demand to write for classes. Um, but actually this semester in particular has been really um, rewarding um, because um, I've been able to get very concrete feedback uh, from professors on not only like the flow and larger structure of writing, but what it means to concretely improve and strengthen, whether it's your thesis, whether it's the um, synthesis of arguments, et cetera. Um, and um, I've also been working on a manuscript that I started um, late last year on Korean American women's understanding of their racial and ethnic identities and actually like seeing that from this perspective of inheritance as, as the women describe, um, which has been a really eye-opening experience um, because you see that this idea of like your racial ethnic identity, particularly when it comes to different generations of immigrants are constantly evolving. Yet, um, I think there's been like a stereotypical message of, you know, how immigrants like see, see their um, identity and, and reflect on that. Thank you all so much. I, I, there's so many things I wanna ask. I think I'm gonna keep it at just a, a general level right now, just about writing, writing styles and, and your influences, and then I'll dive into to the, the cross-language, cross cross-language, cross-culture aspects, because that, that is fascinating. And then maybe some specific questions for you that are coming in. But um, I, want to, I want to ask you this, uh, as, as effective writers, which you all are, um, to your mind, what, what would you define as a good writer? And do you consider yourselves to be good writers? What, what would you think would be the hallmarks of, of good writing for you? Well, I, I think that you get better and better and better the more and more you write. Uh, it's a trial and error. Um, you can see, uh, I bet that all of us here, we have a manuscript of the first draft and you will see a lot of editing and scratches of word and things like that. Uh, and sometimes if, if you have to decide when to stop because you always, <laughs> have other ideas that come sometimes for me, and I know other writers, they come at three in the morning and they wake you up and you have to uh, 
bless that message by writing it down. And then you go back to sleep and it comes again and it comes again. Uh, and many writers will tell you that that happens, but it's the practice, it's the criticism too. Uh, I accept criticism uh, a lot uh, because I learn on my own. I had a good teacher in, in, in my bachelor's in, 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 in uh, a, a literature class. Uh, and he said, writing is work. You have to work it uh, constantly. And as a dyslexic, I learned by visualizing things. So writing, if I, I stopped doing studies because there were a lot of data and I think that data informed me in order to write a story. So everybody can understand what the data says. And that's Pablo Freire type of uh, teaching, uh, which I, to me is the most successful, successful tool of teaching in the world because it's completely non-traditional. And I think that uh, in the United States, especially we have an Anglo-Saxon male type of uh, educational culture that goes back to the 18th, 19th uh, century. And we need to get out of that and we need to update the way we teach, the way we write. And Pablo Freire is uh, the one that illustrate my, my road to become a better writer and a, and a teacher is, is make those numbers be real. Powerful, thank you. To me, I think a good writer is someone who has to who has something to say that is valuable because there is a lot of writing that is out there, which is just for a reason of writing. Um, I don't write too often because not all the time I have something to say. Um, and um, a good writer to me is someone just like Jaime said, who can take feedback and make it better. Someone who is not arrogant and overconfident to say that they know everything, but rather really acknowledge uh, what has been done before them. Um, and um, someone who can connect to the reality and broader world rather than being in their own bubbles because that's what we do most of the time especially as you know scholars who are specifically focusing on one specific area i think you know we most of us do that a lot um, and if we cannot connect it to the broader context it becomes you know very specific not um available to everyone. So I think, you know, having that, um, the bigger picture is always important. And I mentioned journalist background because I think it has made me both effective and non-effective writer in, 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 in two ways. Well, in one way, I guess. Uh, uh, when I was training, it was not my, you know, diploma. It was like just, you know, uh, one month intensive course and then we started working. Uh, basically, that was my training. And the most important training or something that I received in that training uh, was uh, one of those trainers. Like I brought them a two page uh, script of what I was going to be reporting on. They left three sentences um, from that, the two pages, three sentences. This is everything that you need to say on, on this topic. The rest is water. We Nobody has time for this. I think this has stuck with me. And I always talk, especially in you know policy writing, for instance, and social work, that is a very valuable skill, which comes uh, with a lot of practice. Like it's not easy to write a two page say, I mean, to say two page, what you have to say in one minute rather than, you know, 10, it's like a skill that we develop a lot. But then it's like, whenever I write, it takes me very, very long time to write something because I have to put that, I, I keep that all the time with me. So I write slow, but then at the end it is, I, I don't have to edit too much. I do because of my English, of course. Um, uh, but then it's like, it's something that uh, helps me uh, kind of produce something more or less in the final version. 
and the and the and the and the second uh, advice I got, and you know, I I yeah you know, also use like writing in simple language, like use simpler words rather than complicated words. I think to me, as someone who like you know learned English or other languages, it's always useful because like to me that's that's something that is available to me, and I write in that simpler language, and I try like also to kind of make because it it then becomes available to others as well who do not necessarily have that specific knowledge so I, I would say I'm somewhere in between <laughs> I was going to say that I've come to the belief that good writers are also good listeners in this culture of the United States we're very invested in what I'm going to say and how I'm going to say it <clears throat> In all too many conversations, it becomes clear. There comes a point when you stop listening to the other person because you're busily preparing what it is you're gonna say. We miss a lot that in writing is very important because if we're all about reacting to and making sure that we're communicating with an audience, knowing something about the audience is often what you get by listening carefully to what other people say. The idea that you write for yourself that you wanna make sure that it's elegant, pristine, grammatically and syntactic correct. Yeah, that's definitely a part of it. But if the ultimate attempt is to communicate, then knowing something about the audience with whom you're communicating becomes kind of critical. And sometimes that happens because you've spent enough time listening to what people say, so they get a real sense of who they are. And therefore, you know how you're gonna say something that's most likely to strike a really important concordant note in them and with the message that you're trying to impart. Writing and listening, it seems to me, are inseparable. Yes. That's great. Um, Jen, did you have any thoughts on, on, on this point? And I, there was a question too that came in about, um, for specifically for you about balancing the requirements of academic writing uh, so that it fulfills standards uh, for, for academic work, but without being alienating or elitist. So I just wanted to throw that out there too and see if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that's, um, <laughs> that's a question that I continue to wrestle with as a student, um, but I absolutely agree with what Mashura said about choosing simpler um, words and language um, in comparison to something that's more complex. And this is actually the feedback that I've been getting the most from, from the faculty that I've been working with is that, um, and I am learning and also I'm learning that you know, I came into academia thinking, oh, there's like certain expectation for more sort of fabricated or like complex words and language. But <laughs> if you're not able to understand what you're reading, then that's really um, a shortcoming and failure on the end of the author. You can have the best and most innovative ideas, but if you cannot translate that across to your audience and to, to those who are reading your work, then um, then there's a lot that's being lost in, in translation. Um, so with standards, I, I really appreciate um, that I have access to faculty who are more than willing to be very clear um, and transparent about, about expectations. Um, but also, I've also found it helpful in writing groups, whether it's with fellow students or in classrooms, that we communally build a set of expectations and also standards we exchange practices, we give feedback, and it's a communal learning experience of, okay, as a community, what do we want to establish as, um, as a standard that, that we're seeking and balancing both um, accessibility, but also like rigor um, and data-driven, data-based um, work. So I hope that answers the question. I don't know, terrific. It, it's really fascinating. And um, some, some great comments coming into the chat too. I hope you're uh, able to keep up with those a little bit. But I, I want to jump now to um, the different backgrounds and cultures and languages that you've all described and your experiences uh, with those. And wondering whether your writing process differs uh, with respect to, um, to the language or cultural context that you're working in, and, and, and if so, how? So I'll, I'll throw that out. Well, um... There, there was something called the, the Latin boom in the 1970s and, and 80s, uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s. 
uh, in which uh, Latino writers uh, were dominating basically uh, the world of uh, novels, uh, essays, etc. And it was called the, the, the Latin boom, boom, something like that. And they asked Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, who won the Nobel uh, Peace Prize, I mean, uh, Literature uh, uh, Prize, uh, why is it that you Latinos write so much? And he said, he didn't like the, <laughs> the question. And he said, because we have a lot to say. And it's funny because I'm a fan of Gabriel Garcia Marquez and most of the writers of that era, but I'm totally the opposite. I try to, to keep it to a minimum and I concentrate more on aphorisms. Uh, like I have a whole book that I can publish on aphorisms. Uh, and is, I think that Matura and, and Jen were alluding to that, how to make a whole theory and make it simple in one sentence. And even when, uh, and I think that that's extremely needed, especially in academia. This is these things that I believe we should be changing. Uh, how we make all that simple and we can address more than one community, more than the uh, academic community. Uh, those barriers uh, have to be eliminated and writing is one of those ways by making something uh, uh, simple in one sentence. And Gabriel Garcia Marquez was one of those writers that could put a whole economic theory in one sentence or two and make it funny. That everybody could digest, everybody could make it their own and also illuminate themselves with that new knowledge. And I think that uh, that's my problem with academia <laughs> and, uh, and also with uh, writers that can write to a lot like Gabriel Garcia Marquez, but also had plenty of aphorisms that illustrate the point. To me, um, yeah, it's absolutely different uh, processes. Um, uh, writing in two different languages, for instance, has to bring, it, it brings in the experiences, the culture, the history, the way people live. I think all of that is um, integrated in writing. So um, you cannot just, you know, get like, write in one language and translate it. It becomes very hard. So you have to really, think in that language. Um, um, and I think it gets harder the less um, you use um, that language. So um, like I, 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 you know, I, I mentioned I don't use, I mean, uh, Tajik uh, in writing, unfortunately. And this is reminding me that I should more often because um, I think one of the things that is challenging in other languages that comes with the other barriers um, for science, for instance, right, or the production of that knowledge, um, it, 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 like you don't have the resources that you can rely on. So some of the things are, are definitely part and parcel of writing in, in other language that is also shaped by the context uh, of, of it. Uh, but then also the culture comes in because in some cultures you cannot say some things directly or you don't have a word for something, right? Um, in, in my work, we were trying to kind of, um, we're working on um, building this new like social work profession in a place where it didn't exist yet. And in trying to bring the training like on like social justice, for instance, right? Advocacy. I had no words for it in Russian, like no words for advocacy because it wasn't practiced there, right? So you have to find ways to, 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 um, to change your language based on the realities. Um, so, so, so definitely, you know, very different processes.
Jen or Bob, did you want to add to that? Oh, absolutely fascinated by the yeah. discussion. <clears throat> One of the things that has really been important to me in response to the question has been the fact that the French government has as one of the most important pillars of its foreign policy, making the French language available to anybody who wants to speak it. If you look at the language learning tools that are available in French and compare them with any other language, you're gonna see that there's a huge difference. La Francophonie, which is an international organization sponsored by the French government is literally about making sure that if you wanna speak French, we're gonna give you access to it. Third thing, and this is something that I learned from Claire Rosenfield, who happens to be present in this webinar. She is the wife of Alan Rosenfield, our late dean of the school of Millman School of Public Health. She speaks French fluently, and she was one of those folks early on in my self-taught efforts to be fluent in French, pointed out, thank God for l'Académie Française. What singles French out from many other language is that there is this notion that there's a central authority that is really clear about how you use the language. No matter where you go in the world, you will find all kinds of Creole languages that are variations on formal French. But the minute you start to speak formal French, boom, everybody falls into place. L'Académie Française is present in the room. And it makes it a lot easier to speak across cultures because if at least you share that knowledge of that language, which is the second diplomatic language in the world, it makes it that much easier to make sure that you won't have your message biased by local variations in how people are speaking the language. That's not to say again, that it isn't really important to be able to speak Creole in a lot of settings, but certainly for what we as academics do, and certainly for what happens when you're in diplomatic circles, the fact that there's at least less likely to be a lot of variation in the way particular terms in French are gonna be used does make it easy for those of us who have to write and communicate in that language to be sort of assured that, yeah, I'm probably correct in saying it this way, for what it's worth. Yeah, um, something, there are two things that came to my mind in, in response to the question. The first was, I think it was um, Professor Fulop who had talked about being a good writer um, is connected to being a good listener. So I think how I try to practice that is um, if I'm writing in Korean, then um, I think the first thing I do is whether it's like looking up literature or reading uh, books and materials um, that's written in Korean on the, on the topic that I desire to write about. Um, that's something that I try to practice as a way of listening um, to words and the sort of the trend and also how certain concepts that may like cut across cultures are presented differently in different languages. Like I'm um, sure noted that there are sometimes in Korean and English, there's no same expressions or one expression may exist in one language and not the other. Um, so I, that's how I think I try to be mindful of the audience of hopefully my writing um, that will turn into either Korean or English and being mindful of the language, the culture and the context that's present. Um, and the second thing um, that came to my mind was this idea of trans creation. So this is a term that was shared with me by a, a good friend of mine. And he essentially talked about it as like translation um, is something that focuses on the accuracy of like replacing one word or another or one like phrase with another whereas trans creation really focuses on the substance of the message. So that means you might not only change the grammar, but you might like use actually words that are different um, or having to use three, four or five more words to describe one con like one word in another language, but it is really the, the transferring or conveying the message um, that's most appropriate with the context of the language that you're like translating or writing in. I love that word transcreation. I have not heard that before, but yeah, it, it's, it's about the communication of the message, the essence of it. Um, this is fascinating. Um, I, I, I wonder if you could, um, I'll tell us, uh, you know, has there been some piece of advice about writing that you've received over the years uh, that has really stuck with you uh, and, and that has influenced your, your writing styles now? Anything leap to mind? Um, 
There, I have one, um, yeah. which is to, I was told to read my writing out loud. Um, and I owe that to the CSSW Writing Center that I remember going to my first um, writing center appointment. And that was a first sort of question that the consultant had um, asked of me. And that was mind blowing because I had never done that prior to that. Um, and since then that's been like fully integrated into every piece of writing that I have. Can I just say that I learned that here too? And it was one of these writing lives panels. Uh, it wasn't a panelist. It was, you know, it was a panelist who said, read it out loud to yourself. I'd never thought of that before, but it, it makes a huge difference. I agree. Uh, others. <laughs> That's one uh, that I have used, but since I write in English now more than in Spanish, you know, and then I listen myself with the accent and then <laughs> I said, okay, that's it. Uh, I, I don't even understand what I said. So, but I think the most important thing for me is basically uh, the criticism that I get from other writers uh, who mean well. I think that uh, we have to be able to, to receive criticism and, and without taking it uh, personal. Uh, and the other thing is basically uh, knowing that you are not gonna write what you are planning to write in one month or one summer. Uh, usually what the writing tells you, ex talks back to you and tells you, you are not finished with me. And page by page, the writer has to be listening to the notes, to what is writing in the computer or the paper, because there is a conversation and it's the most pure conversation. And it's the conversation that we always uh, reject, which is the conversations that we have with ourselves. And writing facilitate a conversation with you. It's an introspection because at the end, like actors, I, I write plays, actors in method acting, they said, you play yourself. Uh, you don't play the character, uh, uh, the, the caricature of the, car of the character. It's what is inside of you that can contribute. So it's the same thing with writing. Uh, you have a, a political opinion, you have a sociological opinion, cultural opinion, but you are in each one of those. And if you don't understand yourself talking what you write, uh, maybe what you're writing is not that honest. Uh, or maybe you are writing for others uh, to impress and not, uh, or to make sure that your book is, is, is sold. Uh, you, you know, and, and that is never going to, to be honest. And the most important thing is the honest thing you're writing. Well said. <laughs> just want to say that I really, throughout a long life, struggle with criticism. I'm not good at all when somebody says, you know, Bob, I don't know about this. In French, however, I've really had to accept that no matter what I think, maybe what I'm saying isn't exactly what a reader is going to take out of the words that I put on paper. So being able to give what I write to somebody else saying, could you critique this for me? <laughs> is on the one hand, unbelievably difficult, but what you got to do to, in fact, that's one of the critics calling him now. <laughs> I owe a couple of people pieces. But at any rate, I mean, more than anything else, whatever I might think about my writing in English, I have to abandon all that when I'm trying to communicate in French and showing it to somebody else and being able to be okay with the critiques as opposed to, I'm going to just throw this away. It's obviously not worth anything but actually being able to follow good advice when I'm given it. You would think at my age, since I'm almost 80, that I would have learned that. Nope. So one of the things that has been really useful is in another language, I'm much more likely to pay attention to stuff that in English, I still struggle for what it's worth. Um, for me, um, it would be, uh, as I mentioned, like, um, kill ruthlessly any words or sentences that don't um, add to the point. Um, and writing simple and knowing your audience. I think um, um, Professor Trulau, you mentioned that earlier, but knowing who is gonna be reading your work, for whom you are working and knowing the impact um, 
of your words would be also important. Um, and I had something else in mind, but I forgot. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, I cannot, I cannot, I mean, especially for those who write in, not in their native language, like having someone look over it is critical. Um, I have always found someone like, whether it was writing center when I was a student um, or a colleague or uh, students in some cases too, where we collaborated, I've learned so much just by looking at that feedback. I guess it's like it comes with maybe some of those insecurities that you mentioned in, in the language that you don't speak, but it's always helpful to have uh, someone read your work on top of reading it out loud. Any other thoughts on that point? All right, we're, we're uh, the hour always flies by with these, uh, but but I would like to end. I think a fair number of folks who've tuned in are students, uh, and I consider myself one of them. Uh, but if if you had some parting words of advice, wisdom, encouragement for students in social work, what would those be? Embrace your solitude. Uh, hmm. I think that uh, I mean if, if you live with you're a parent and have children that you're not going to have that solitude. But uh, whenever you have that moment of solitude, it's good to reflect on, on yourself and all that. But don't keep the wisdom that you solitude to give you. Uh, don't throw it away. Uh, listen, there is a lot in our lives that are not only important, but they're very poetic. Writing to me is an act of, um, and I don't want to sound cursy or anything, you know, like, uh, I, it's an act of love, you know? Uh, you love the characters. Uh, even the characters that are bad in your, in your writing. Uh, you, you, you need to feel as much as you can and uh, just, just don't reject those messages that, that, that come to you. But solitude is important. If you don't love yourself, <laughs> you cannot love others. And if you can put the love that you have in writing, uh, it's part of humanity. They will understand what you're trying to say, even if it was for you. Thank you. Bob? I'm just really thankful for this session. I struggle a great deal with students who have the sense that if you speak English, everybody in the world is eventually gonna follow suit. That we are respecting the notion that as a planet, the Tower of Babel is real, that we are multicultural and therefore multilinguistic, legitimizing those of us who speak another language in a nation that is often really unforgiving with something like that, in New York City, it's rare to find a sign that's written in anything other than English, but in other international capitals, you're going to see a multitude of language so that people don't get lost. Now, I just want to express my thanks for having this session and for legitimizing the notion that this is a really important part of academia and encourage students who are sort of playing around with mastering another language. Oh, please, by all means do. What it does to enrich your point of view and your work, for me at least, is indescribable. I, I have to agree with that. Um, I, that would be the, the, the advice that I would, like if you don't know any other language, just, just do it, just, just try it. You know, um, I am like learning three languages right now and it's incredibly helpful when, if you're working uh, internationally, even if you don't speak, even if you can't understand everything, at least you get some of the things that don't get translated. It's incredibly helpful to be there to at least say, oh yeah, I understand this and not ask, you know, and, and, and like it's, it's uh, such a privilege to, to speak one language and, and, and think that others should understand you, which is not the case um, uh, anywhere else, like in, in many places. So um, definitely something that I would leave you with. And, and uh, second, I'm sorry, I'm taking the last 
time, but like uh, what I learned during COVID uh, and was this experience of the book is having um, time, specific time to write with the group that um, actually has the same goals is going to be so effective. Like um, the rights, like writing the circles. Um, I think Mattia, you, you introduced that to me, um, Mattia, who is in the, in the audience, but it's very helpful. Um, for me, I, to my fellow students, um, that we, um, that we should, and <laughs> we should embrace our lived experiences and, and, um, the walks that we have taken, um, especially if you're writing in different languages that are trusting our processes, um, that there's no like uniform one way, particularly think as students in the U S, um, like doing things in English, there seems like one like standardized way of writing um, and approaching that process, but um, that process can look very different in different languages and whatever feels most comfortable for you, um, that that process is completely trustworthy. Um, I hate to bring this to a close, but that is my job at this stage. Uh, I can see from the comments, we've had uh, some great engagement with uh, everyone in the audience. Thank, ev thanks to everyone for, for participating today, especially our panelists. Um, and just a couple of notes as we close. I'm sorry to, to those who posted questions in the Q&A that we just haven't had time for. There were millions of terrific questions that we would have loved to, to get to. And I want to echo uh, what you said and, and thank Adam and Chin for, having, for conceptualizing this session uh, and, and tying in this notion of languages and cultures, which has been just so illuminating uh, in many ways. And I'll close with, I love the fact that in the chat, we have different languages being expressed. I don't know if you've noticed that, uh, but I think that's just a beautiful reflection of what you all have inspired today. So thank you.